Really excited to be able to talk to you all today about a topic that's near and dear, not only to my heart, but to my eyes. Um, we're talking about the ocular hazards of trumpet playing, and the reason I talk about this is, um, this is me, uh, as you can see here. And Before residency, I was a pretty active musician in the community here. Um, the clip you're hearing is an old jazz standard that I was uh, playing at a, at a club, and I had the really good opportunity to be able to work with a lot of different musicians, record with a lot of different musicians, without ever thinking about that there were ocular consequences to playing an instrument. Um, and uh, I don't think most of the musicians know about that either. There, we know about the uh, musculoskeletal consequences, we know about the pulmonary consequences, but actually thinking about the ocular consequences is something that um, is not very well known. Um, so thinking about this, um, we have the good fortune to work with people here, like Dr. Orozco, who never fails to remind us to think about outside the box, think about other things when we're looking at patients um, who don't seem to be you know, responding to things the way we want them to, or to uh, uh, who, are, who are progressing despite our, our best treatments. And so today we're gonna take a look at, uh, kind of a deeper look into some of the ocular consequences of playing the trumpet and how those can manifest um, in musicians um, as we go. So, um, it's important to talk first about how brass instruments work. Um, this is an important concept in, in citing, uh, looking, or looking at um, why there might be ocular consequences. So, I give a lecture, or I give a talk to elementary students um, every year, uh, and I tell them that the trumpet is basically a, a megaphone. It works to amplify what the musician puts into it. And what musicians put into it is vibrations. And I'm going to show you just what those vibrations sound like here um, so you can see what, uh, how we make sound on the trumpet. Um, this clip right here. Smaller vibrational area, right? So if I do this. It's taking it up about a major third, right? Now if I put the trumpet on. So you can see that the trumpet serves to amplify the vibrations that we make with our mouth. And the way we make those vibrations has been a subject of a bit of controversy in the literature here. And it comes down to this idea of a valsalva. The valsalva uh, is classically divided into four phases. I think we're all familiar with what a valsalva is. But a valsalva typically um, has a rise in blood pressure with inspiration due to compression of the thoracic aorta. It's subsequently followed by a fall in blood pressure with decreased venous uh, return and closure of the glottis. When the glottis is released, there's a drop in thoracic pressure with restoration of venous return, and there's subsequent increased cardiac output with reflex bradycardia. Graphically, it looks like this. We can see, um, as we go here, we have that rise in blood pressure initially, uh, followed by the fall in blood pressure. As the glottis opens, we see the change here with the subsequent rise in uh, blood pressure, cardiac output, and the subsequent reflex bradycardia. The reason why this is controversial in trumpet playing is because playing trumpet with a closed glottis um, results in poor tone, it results in decreased range, just poor sound overall. And so there's numerous articles, numerous books in the trumpet literature written about how to avoid playing with a closed glottis. And so when people would talk about that when you're playing a brass instrument you're doing a valsalva, brass instrumentalists don't really like to hear that because we don't like to think that we're playing with a closed glottis. It turns out, though, that when you actually look at the physiology of playing an instrument, um, it seems that there probably is some uh, physiology that's consistent with a uh, valsalva when you're playing uh, when you're playing an instrument. So this is an article that, that uh, took tuba players and had them play different tones, and they looked at uh, different hemodynamic properties um, that are shown here. I want to highlight just a few things here. You can see that when in the middle notes and higher notes. These are very defined um, changes in blood pressure and heart rate. And when we compare it to uh, our classic uh, description of a valsalva, we can see that the hemodynamics are actually very similar. And so while we may not be playing with a closed glottis, um, the hemodynamics are very similar, and they're likely, there's likely some component of a valsalva when uh, brass musicians are playing. And that's an important concept to understand here. Now, we're going to talk about intraocular pressure changes in brass musicians because this is an, an important um, segue into what we need to know. So there have been multiple studies that have demonstrated increased intraocular pressure with valsalva maneuvers. But one of the first major studies to look at intraocular pressure changes in brass musicians uh, was done in 2000 by Joel Schumann's group at Tufts. 
Uh, this is a multi-part study, and we're going to talk about all the parts of the study as we go. But the first part of the study took three musicians with open angle glaucoma who underwent continuous intraocular pressure monitoring while playing, as well as undergoing ultrasound uh, to evaluate uveal thickness. Um, intraocular pressure monitoring was done in both the supine and the uh, sitting up position. Um, patients were asked to play normally and then to play quite loud. You can see that there's a significant increase in intraocular pressure in all subjects, actually quite dramatically. So you can see that in what they consider high resistance wind instruments, so the oboe and the trumpet, uh, intraocular pressures rose into the 40s, where um, in the clarinet and saxophone, some of the lower resistance instruments, the intraocular pressure rose to a lesser degree. This is a tracing, uh, the continuous pneumotonometry that they did, and you can see here, they asked the participant to begin playing here. There was a slow, kind of a very mild increase in pressure. And as we asked the participant to increase their volume and their pitch, we see a much greater increase up to their maximum pressure here of around 40, okay? Now, one of the critiques of this study was this. So, <laughs> this is how they tested uh, the continuous pneumotonometry. And this is not uh, a physiologic way of playing. No one plays trumpet like this. Um, and so the critique was that, well, we're not doing these measurements under normal conditions. We're changing the way the inner thoracic and the inner intra-abdominal muscles work. We're probably increasing the back pressure because, I mean, it looks like he's working pretty hard here. And so, you know, these pressures may be falsely elevated in the setting of this kind of non-physiologic way of playing. So in 2010, a second study came out that looked to identify um, uh, uh, intraocular pressure changes under more normal playing conditions. Um, in this study, we took 37 professional brass players and 15 professional woodwind players um, and had them uh, uh, play under more normal conditions. So for the first part of this, we had them play tones of normal uh, or of low, middle, and high frequencies with increasing volumes. And in the second part, they played standard exercises, uh, standard literature for 10 minutes, followed by a high frequency note uh, with maximal exertion. And what we see is this. So this bottom graph here um, shows the uh, changes in intraocular pressure, the mean changes in intraocular pressure for each pitch that was played. Every time, every pitch that was played showed an increase in about three to four millimeters of mercury uh, for each pitch. And that was a statistically significant difference. What's shown up top here, and I'm gonna blow it up for us right here, is the outliers. And so for each uh, pitch that was played, uh, they, know, they uh, showed the uh, maximum pressures for those, those different tones. And you can see that for these different pitches, even just playing a normal pitch at a normal frequency and a normal volume, uh, this is a pretty significant increase in some of these participants, getting as high as 48 um, in playing a middle frequency note. Um, you can see the um, percentage of uh, participants who got into the ocular hypertension range for each of these frequencies as well. Chris, yeah. how did they measure the pressure? So this was done with an eye care. This was done with eye care. And one of the limitations here is that they didn't specify whether these <coughs> participants for the different frequencies were the same participants who had these spikes or whether they were different participants, which would have been something good to know um, to analyze this data a little bit better. From the short-term playing results, when they um, had the participant play for 10 minutes, you can see a small increase in pressure um, with uh, reduction in pressures uh, as we uh, continued. And then when they asked them to play with maximal exertion after that 10 minutes, we saw a significant spike. And again, um, pretty significant spikes um, in, these, in these outliers here, going all the way up to nearly over 50. 50% um, of these musicians reached ocular hypertension level when asked to play uh, this high note here. They didn't see any difference uh, in short-term playing versus high and low resistance instruments, but uh, there was a uh, significant difference for increases in intraocular pressure in middle and high frequency tones between um, high resistance instruments and low resistance instruments. And so their conclusion was that sustained tones cause significant elevation in intraocular pressure uh, in brass players, um, as shown in this study. I want to mention one more study on intraocular pressure. This was done in 2017. This is another two-part study. Um, the first part, they evaluated intraocular pressure after having musicians play for 20 minutes. They took 42 wind musicians, uh, professional and amateur musicians, and nine subjects had existing diagnoses of glaucoma. The second part of their study looked at 24-hour intraocular pressure monitoring with a triggerfish contact lens. So we can see here the demographics uh, of the professional amateur musicians. 
and the intraocular pressure change uh, 20 minutes after playing the instrument. And interestingly, there was a significant change uh, with higher pressures noticed in professional musicians as opposed to amateurs. And there really wasn't a good explanation for why this happened. It's an interesting finding and needs to be looked at further, but um, uh, just kind of something to note there. That was the only significant thing that they found here. Looking at patients between, uh, differences between patients with glaucoma and no glaucoma, there wasn't any significant difference uh, found in pressure changes between those two groups. And this brings up the question of um, autoregulation. So the thought was is that they measured intraocular pressure after playing the instrument for 20 minutes. They didn't do any measurements during playing. And so the question was, as, as autoregulation happens, is it bringing these pressures back down to the point where now we measure it after 20 minutes, the pressures are uh, back to a more normal range, uh, falsely showing us that there wasn't any significant difference. Um, again, just something to think about there. The second part of their study looked, um, had them use a trigger fish contact lens to do 24 hour intraocular pressure monitoring in patients with glaucoma. And you can see that uh, their uh, ophthalmic history here and medications that uh, a couple of these patients were on. Just as an aside, this is what the triggerfish contact lens looks like here. Um, this is uh, oftentimes attached to a base station that records the intraocular pressure monitoring data. And interestingly, the triggerfish lens doesn't measure intraocular pressure directly. It measures uh, strain differences, is how they describe it. So it measures changes in intraocular pressure, changes in intraocular volume, and changes in ocular elasticity. And so the tracings that you'll see here don't correlate with intraocular pressure um, uh, directly. This study, unfortunately, has some problems. Um, there were recording difficulties with the contact lens in over half of the participants here, which makes the data a little bit difficult to interpret. Um, interestingly, though, in a couple of these participants, you can see spikes when uh, the participants were playing, but even in some of these participants, you can see higher spikes even when they were sleeping as opposed to when they uh, were playing their instruments. So, like I said, there were some uh, problems with the data here as opposed to how they recorded it and, and the uh, recording methods of the triggerfish lens. But this would be another interesting thing to look at as the technology for 24-hour continuous monitoring uh, improves, uh, repeating something like this to see if there are significant alterations um, in participants as we, go, as we go along. So we've seen now that there are increases in intraocular pressure, but are these increases clinically significant, meaning uh, do these changes in intraocular pressure cause um, uh, changes in, in visual fields or cause um, risk of progression of glaucoma? So uh, the second part of Schumann's study uh, looked at uh, 46 volunteer musicians stratified into high and low resistance and non-wind instruments. Um, all of these musicians underwent comprehensive exams with gonioscopy, dilation, and visual fields. Um, this is showing how they uh, graded visual fields, and they reported the presence of abnormal fields, and they reported the presence of pattern standard deviation of these fields. The results showed no difference in optic nerve head appearance based on clinical exam, but three of nine high-resistance wind instruments uh, musicians had abnormal visual fields compared to one of 11 and two of 23 non-wind instruments. Uh, the participants with abnormal visual fields had significantly increased pattern standard deviation scores, which I've shown here um, almost doubled uh, their uh, correct pattern standard deviation. Now, unfortunately, they didn't specify what kind of visual field defects. Um, they didn't really give any additional information, just that there was an increase in these high wind resistance instruments um, in their level of abnormal visual fields. They also found that in a, in a regression analysis that um, life hours of playing showed significant relation with the development of an abnormal visual field. You can see here that um, they showed significant um, increases in, um, uh, or significant relations rather, with um, abnormal visual fields. And the numbers that they gave were for every thousand hours of playing a high resistance wind instrument, uh, it, it uh, predicted a 0 .009 increase in pattern standard deviation uh, for these musicians. So the limitations here, obviously this is a small sample size, they didn't specify any visual field defects, and kind of a common theme in a lot of these studies is that they're not taking into account other comorbidities that can lead to glaucomatous damage, such as sleep apnea, hypertension, and those other things that we know can be pretty significant inf inf uh, influencers now. A second study came out in 2018 looking at visual field changes in uh, players in a Philadelphia orchestra. So 
uh, 51 musicians from the Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, 21 wind, music wind musicians, 39 wind musicians, um, and six patients in this group with either self-reported glaucoma or glaucoma suspect. Uh, they did baseline screening exams on all 51 musicians, which included visual acuity, intraocular pressure measurements, and dilated or undilated fundus photography. Um, mass specialists uh, reviewed the image and classified um, the optic nerves as either glaucoma suspect or normal based on the criteria listed here. And the optic nerves were also graded according to the disc damage likelihood scale um, with scores assigned from 1 to 10 um, to gauge their risk of having glaucoma damage. They identified 17 musicians uh, with suspicious optic nerves, nine wind instrumentalists and eight non-wind instrumentalists. And of those 17, 12 came back for more comprehensive exams, which included pachymetry, visual fields, gonioscopy, and an, and an undilated fundus exam. And from here, patients were diagnosed as either having glaucoma, being a glaucoma suspect, having ocular hypertension, or having no glaucomatous features um, on their exam. So this is a table from the chart, and I'm gonna highlight just a couple of things. Number one, we see that the age of uh, the wind instrumentalists compared to the non-wind instrumentalists were significantly different. Wind instrumentalists had it were significantly older. Um, we also see that the visual field defects here were significantly greater in wind instrumentalists as opposed to non-wind instrumentalists. Uh, there are mean deviations here. None of the other things, central corneal thickness, um, uh, the disc damage likelihood score, cup to disc ratios, none of these other things really had any significance aside from these two findings here. And what they did here was a multi-variable -regre regression uh, similar to what Schumann did that showed a significant increase um, in practice time and a significant correlation with practice time and visual field defects. I've written it out here for us, but um, they showed that um, there's a 0.7, a 0.07 uh, increase in visual field mean defect for every hour, thousand hours increase in cumulative practice time. Um, so it uh, looks like there's something there. Again, this is a small sample size. There's no discussion of other medical comorbidities. Uh, most of these participants were first-time visual field takers, and there was really a lack of OCT data. They did clinical exams, but didn't look at any OCT data. So what are some possible mechanisms for visual field loss? Uh, obviously, the easy answer is elevated intraocular pressure. So there's multiple proposed mechanisms for elevated intraocular pressure in musicians. And it all goes back to this idea of the Valsalva. Valsalvas cause elevated intrathoracic pressure, which reduces venous return and increases venous backflow. Uh, this can cause elevated episcleral venous pressures and can lead to choroidal engorgement, leading to expansion and subsequent rises in intraocular pressure. And this was demonstrated in Schumann's study where they looked at the anterior uvial thickness in, uh, the, Trump, in the musicians uh, as they played. Uh, prior to playing, you can see the um, anterior uveal thickness right here uh, as 0.371 millimeters. As they played, that uh, uveal <coughs> thickness increased here, uh, and the thought was this is due to engorgement of the uvea from elevated episcleral uh, venous pressure. There's also the thought that intermittent angle closure may have a role uh, in these uh, changes as well. There have been multiple studies that have shown reductions in anterior chamber depth and narrowing of the angles during Valsalva maneuvers, and this is an anterior segment OCT showing the different measurements that can be taken uh, for these studies. Patel, um, in 2016, published a study of 22 professional Indian wind musicians. They did comprehensive exams on all these patients with intraocular pressure measurements and gonioscopy, and none of these patients had uh, narrow angles. They all were uh, documented as open. But what they found in these was that 72% of these wind musicians had pigment clumps and multiple pigment clumps in the angle compared to 9% of age match controls. And this picture doesn't project very well, but they're trying to demonstrate the pigment clumping that they found. And their conclusion was that these pigment clumps um, are <coughs> records or evidence of prior um, episodes of intermittent angle closure. And the thought was is that as these wind musicians are doing these Valsalvas, are they having increased um, uh, episodes of intermittent angle closure, um, leading to uh, these, uh, these elevated pressures? Elevated central retinal venous pressure is also something that needs to be considered. So CRVP has been shown to be elevated in patients with glaucoma. Uh, in this study that was done in 2014, 96% of normal controls uh, showed spontaneous venous pulsations compared to 46% in early glaucoma and absent uh, venous pulsations in those with advanced glaucoma. 
There is significantly elevated CRVP in these patients with glaucoma. Uh, here they use contact dynamometry to determine the, elevate, the uh, retinal venous pressure. And what they found was that in controls without glaucoma, their retinal venous pressure was around 14 millimeters of mercury as a mean value. In those with intermediate to advanced glaucoma, their uh, retinal venous pressure was significantly elevated almost to 40 millimeters of mercury. And this resulted in significantly reduced ocular perfusion pressure with controls um, having ocular perfusion pressures uh, right around 50 millimeters of mercury and those with intermediate to advanced glaucoma having a nearly uh, half reduction um, in their uh, ocular perfusion pressure. In trumpet players, this is a study that just was published this year, um, also showing that central retinal venous pressure can be elevated in trumpet playing. Here, they did, took 20 amateur trumpet players who underwent measurements of intraocular pressure and retinal venous pressure with dynamometry while playing a standard kind of middle frequency tone on the trumpet. Um, you can see their setup for what they did here. It looks a lot nicer and more physiologic than what uh, the previous studies looked like. Um, and uh, this study actually did a really good job of, of taking out people with systemic comorbidities like sleep apnea, um, like hypertension, and ocular comorbidities that could influence um, the, uh, the results of the study. And so what they found was that central retinal venous pressure became significantly elevated during trumpet playing and became much more elevated than intraocular pressure, actually. So the baseline mean value for retinal venous pressure in these participants was around 21 millimeters of mercury. And when they played trumpet, retinal venous pressure increased to 56 millimeters of mercury with a max in one participant of 80 millimeters of mercury. Um, this um, uh, showed that... Uh, again, that there's a decreased ocular perfusion pressure, which can have impacts not only on the retinal circulation, but also on the optic nerve as well. And this has been potentially implicated, elevated CRVP, um, in brass playing associated recurrent CRVOs. Uh, there's a case report in the literature of a 50-year-old man um, who's a professional trombonist who suffered three retinal vein occlusions in a 10-month period after playing strenuous orchestral pieces. Um, systemic workups were negative, there were no medical comorbidities, and after he retired from playing, he had no recurrence of venous occlusions in 10 years, uh, which suggests that you know, potentially there is a role of elevated um, renal venous pressure. So next steps, we've identified that there are pressure changes, certainly in musicians who play brass instruments. We've shown that there appears at least to be some sort of association with uh, visual field defects. And uh, we've looked at mechanisms for why, they, um, why, why this might happen. So a couple questions that I think uh, deserve a little bit of time. Number one, most studies show no change in optic nerve head appearance. But are there differences that could be detected on OCT? This is a study that um, just hasn't been done yet and hasn't been performed in the literature. The second question is one that um, is a little bit tougher to answer. And should, be, should we be pre-treating, or treating rather, with musicians to prevent glaucomatous damage? And it comes into the question of which musicians would be kind of our targets for therapy. Um, not every musician, obviously, who plays a brass instrument has a glaucoma, but are there risk factors that can be identified that would warrant um, uh, treatment? Perhaps those with more narrow angles, if we're considering intermittent angle closure as a potential mechanism, or targeting those with systemic comorbidities, like hypertension, um, uh, sleep apnea, and those things that could impact blood flow um, to the optic nerve and the retina. Um, again, these are just foods for thought. Um, these answers are not in the literature yet, but as we continue to look at this, hopefully we'll be able to identify um, and uh, you know, better able to target our therapy uh, as we move forward uh, in, this, uh, in this arena. So um, these are some references here, and um, hopefully you don't feel like this girl right here. Um, but um, thanks again for your attention, and happy to take any questions that there might be. Yeah, Dr. Petty. I assume the Philadelphia study, the numbers weren't adequate to really tell, but the age difference and then also having the visual field difference, did they comment on whether just the age difference alone could have explained yeah. that? Yeah, that's a great question, because we know glaucoma is more prevalent in older individuals, and that can certainly be a contributing factor. Um, that was one of the things that they said was um, something they had to take into account in their study. Um, and, um, you know, th yeah, that, that is kind of a confounding factor to their study. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Dr. Sinclair. Uh, beautiful, Chris. Um, there's a parallel here. Uh, anesthesiologists are very concerned 
about cases now of reported monocular or binocular ischemic optic neuropathy immediately following anesthesia. And it could even be local MAC, but with additional um, ventilation for head down positioning for spinal surgery on the back. When the patient is placed head down in a sling and what we have recorded back when I was in Philadelphia, we recorded elevated central venous and, and cavernous sinus uh, elevated pressures, secondary. We only measured central venous pressures. Mm -hmm. And so anesthesiologists are now starting to become very concerned about this. And we thought about developing maybe a VEP binoculars that we would measure the patient while they were being um, anesthetized and doing surgery on. So we could try to detect if this was starting and perhaps what was causing it. It's suggested by, by your trumpet and, and high resistance playing instruments here when they're doing a modified Valsalva. It's the elevated, perhaps central venous and secondary carotid uh, cavernous sinus venous pressure that is reducing the perfusion pressure to the sensitive optic nerve. The optic nerve is much more sensitive than the retina to these changes. And maybe these are the cause of these visual field depicts. Yep. But the whole problem with this is if the anesthesiologist says, oh shit, we're starting to see reduced um, uh, function of the optic nerve. What do you do? Tell this, um, the spine surgeon, got to quit, got to stop. We're, you know, we're, we're at an impasse here. But right. this is a big concern now in the anesthesia world. Right. right. That's yeah. a good point. Stay. So, Chris, you're a trumpet player. Does this review change what you're going to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, actually. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, just because, you know, there's definite changes that have been shown. There's definitely increases in, pre in intraocular pressure. But, um, you know, not everyone who plays a brass instrument has a glaucoma. And until we know what risk factors, until we know what patients are more susceptible uh, to developing complications, it's not really going to change the way that, that I play. Um, so, no, personally, it, it's not going to, I'm not going to stop playing because of this. Do you talk to your uh, musician friends about it? Um, I'm going to start, I think, yeah, just, you know, because we know about the musculoskeletal complications, we know about the pulmonary complications, but I'd never heard of ocular complications until I got to residency, and I guarantee, you know, most people who play uh, don't know that this is potentially a thing um, either. And so just having, you know, regular eye exams, and I think it hopefully prompt more people to just have regular routine exams, um, because this is a, it seems like a risk factor for developing, you know, complications in the eye. Yeah. Would you recommend woodwinds for your friend, for your children then? No, no, I definitely wouldn't recommend woodwinds. Uh, <laughs> brass instruments are clearly superior. So, uh, wooden instruments. Um, String instruments. <laughs> String instruments. There we go. There we go. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.